protector, you don't have so many uh, means of, of, of adapting. OK, so thank you again, Mattia, for your introductory presentation. Thank you. So we will come to our next presenter. It's uh, Strahinia Dojan. And here's your talk. Let's see if. Yeah, now it works. Oh, it works. <laughs> Sorry, Mattia. I'm able to. <laughs> So uh, my name is uh, Strachnia Dosen, as uh, Thierry has said, and I'm uh, coming uh, from the Department of Health Science and Technology from Oldenburg University in Denmark. Uh, I'm an associate uh, professor at that uh, department, and I'm leading a research group on uh, neuro rehabilitation systems. And uh, in the research group, uh, we are dealing with many technologies, and we are also dealing with uh, healthy people, but also with uh, people with disability. And uh, one of our main focus points is a uh, closed group uh, human machine interface. And uh, that means that uh, on the left side, you have a human user. It could be a disabled uh, uh, subject, for example, an amputee or a strong subject, but it could be also a healthy, a healthy uh, person. And on the other side, uh, you have these external devices that uh, this uh, person would like to control. Uh, these external devices uh, could be uh, collaborative robotics in industrial settings, or it could be a prosthesis if we are working with amputees, or it could be virtual reality as in activity. So our uh, main uh, main uh, uh, goal is actually to connect uh, effectively this uh, human user to the to the device and uh, in order to make this connection uh, we have to record signals from the human user and then uh, translate uh, those signals into commands for the device this is not uh, uh, the focus point of tactility but on the other side uh, we always want uh, to close the loop so we would like to read the sensor data from the devices and then uh, transmit this sensor data to the user to actually provide the uh, sensory feedback and this is now the focus point of stability. This is how we ended up in the project. So we read the sensor data, in this case, uh, from virtual reality, and then we deliver stimulation to the user to provide feedback so that uh, there is an integration between the user and uh, the robotic or virtual device that uh, the user is, is controlling. This is the link uh, to, the, to the website of the group. And if you, if you want to see a little bit more about the project that we have right now, you can just uh, visit the web page or you can approach me in, in, the, in the break and then we can discuss uh, different uh, uh, technologies that, that we are using here. So that's uh, just to emphasize that today I'm going to focus on the on the stimulation aspects. So uh, Matia has introduced electrodactyl stimulation uh, and, uh, and our role in the project uh, was uh, to do some basic investigation, to do some basic assessment of uh, what uh, you can do when using electrodactyl stimulation on the, on the, on the hand. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, human sense of touch, and this is something that uh, you all intuitively know, is quite sophisticated. And as uh, Matia has pointed out, uh, the foundation for the human sense of touch are these uh, mechanoreceptors that are embedded in the skin. We have different kinds of mechanoreceptors. Uh, they are connected with neural fibers, and these neural fibers, uh, they go from the skin into the nerve and then to the spinal cord and the brain. And this is what, uh, uh, how we get information about tactile, tactile interaction. Now, one of the points uh, that is very important is that uh, this, uh, uh, you know, distribution of these mechanoreceptors, uh, they are uh, distributed, uh, for example, in the hand, and uh, it's a very dense network of mechanoreceptors. So we have very nice feedback from the hands, and the hands also represent a very nice place to provide this electrotactile stimulation. Because we have high density of the receptors, and most of them are concentrated actually in the fingertips, and then uh, we also have a lot of them in the, in the, in the palm. So our sense of touch, and our skin actually, as the largest organ in the body, uh, provides a, a high resolution uh, topography of the, of the feedback. So that's a lot of potential to provide tactile stimulation for the, for the subject. Now, this is also what uh, Matia has shown. We have different receptors, and if you look into these receptors, I'm not gonna go into details, but they have a very different uh, uh, structure, right? Uh, so for example, these are Meister, Merkel, Pacinian, Turpusculet, and the Ruffini endings for different types of receptors. They have different structure at the end of the receptor because they are sensitive to different aspects of tactile stimulus. For example, Meissner corpuscular detects uh, movement on the skin, so changing movement of the skin. Then uh, medical cells are very good in detecting static pressure if you put your finger into something which is rough. Then uh, Pacinian corpuscular are specialized uh, to detect vibration and the Ruffini endings uh, detect skin stretch. So why do I tell you this? Well, because 
uh, if, if you think about uh, activating the human sense of touch to provide feedback to the human, then uh, the best would be to specifically activate, selectively activate these receptors. So you can look into these as primary colors. And then if we activate selectively these receptors, then we can modulate those primary colors, and then we can provide rich feedback, rich tactile sensation to the human subject. Unfortunately, with electrical stimulation, this is something that we cannot do. At least we cannot do it easy. There are some works in the literature that actually show that you can get some selectivity, but in general, we stimulate non-selectively. So basically, we have an electrode uh, about the skin, and then uh, when we send these uh, electrical pulses, uh, these electrical pulses, they don't activate the receptors, and this is why we cannot activate them selectively. They actually activate the narrow fibers. So whatever is below the electrode gets activated, and typically this is a mix of different rece receptors. And that's now why uh, Matthias said that uh, electrical stimulation uh, feels uh, somehow uh, you know, specific. It's, uh, it's so-called electrical touch, right? And, and we will speak about uh, some sensory modalities a bit, a bit later on. So I think that uh, Matthias has also expressed this nicely, but the point of these lectures is also to uh, uh, emphasize both good points in electrotactile stimulation and maybe some drawbacks of electrotactile stimulation to be really objective. So that's a, that's a kind of a drawback that we cannot selectively activate those, those receptors. On the other side, uh, in electrical stimulation, we generate uh, electrical pulses. Typically, we do biphasic stimulation, so we have a positive and a negative pulse in order to inject current into the tissue and then take it out of the tissue in order not to change the pH value of the, of the tissue. But since we have an electrical circuit, the advantage of electrical stimulation is that we can nicely uh, modulate those electrical parameters of those pulses. And this is something that you can do in vibration in vibrotactile stimulation because it's a mechanical system. It's a system with a resonance. There's a spring in the system, for example, so that you cannot really independently modulate those, those parameters. But in electrical stimulation, we can do this. And this allows us to grade, to, 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 to regulate the quantity and also the quality of these electrotactile sensations that, that you are eliciting in the, in the subject. So if we look into these parameters, uh, then uh, the first parameter is the amplitude of the pulse or the width of the pulse. These are somehow two equivalent uh, parameters. And uh, mapping those parameters into the sensations is very easy. So if you increase the amplitude, as you can imagine, you will increase the intensity of sensation that you are eliciting because you will stimulate more and more narrow fibers. So if I just uh, start with a very small pulse, you will not feel this tactile sensation. Then if I increase the pulse, you will start feeling the electrical pulses, the touch. And then if I increase enough, we will reach a discomfort threshold where stimulation can be uh, not so comfortable uh, anymore. And if you go even higher, you will actually stimulate the pain fibers, neural fibers that are responsible for pain, and uh, you will elicit sen sensation of pain. Now, discomfort and pain is something that obviously we would like to, to avoid. And uh, this is why in, in, in most of the applications of electrotactile feedback, you go with the amplitude between detection and the discomfort. This is the comfortable range of, of stimulation. But again, I, I just want to, to intrigue you here because uh, discomfort and pain, if you think about the application of electrical stimulation in virtual reality, could actually be useful in this context. Because, you know, you have a pointy object, you know, something like a needle, and if you touch it in virtual reality, we can actually produce a sharp pain that corresponds to touching the needle or something sharp, right? So in this case, the disadvantage of Electrotactile stimulation could be actually a unique feature that might be might be exploited. Now, if you think about the frequency, this is the rate of pulses that you deliver to the skin. If you just uh, deliver a single pulse, then uh, you will feel touch, this electrical touch. If this uh, pulse is a uh, small amplitude, this electrical touch can be quite natural, actually. That's what experience shows. Then if you increase the frequency of pulses, uh, you will feel something like a flutter on the skin or some vibration, vibration. And finally, if you go even higher, all these individual pulses will fuse at the level of the, of the brain, and basically you will elicit a, a sensation of fused pressure. That's a superficial pressure on the, on the skin. So as you can see here, we can actually modulate quality of electrical simulation that, of, of, of sensations that, that we are eliciting. And finally, with many pads in the, in the glove that, that Matthias has presented, we can also modulate the location of 
delivery of this electro diaper sensation. And this is just uh, an example from the study that uh, we have done some time ago. Uh, here uh, we have different uh, qualities of sensation. And uh, on uh, this side here uh, in the columns, we actually have uh, the parameters of the electro diaper stimulation. So we have asked subjects to tell us how will you associate what you feel. And indeed, uh, if uh, we deliver only one pulse or a, a stream of pulses, but uh, very low frequency, we actually have a sensation of tapping, like someone is tapping your finger. And as you can see here, the tapping is prevalent sensation, and we don't feel anything strange, like uh, itching or, or, or pinching and, and so on, when the stimulation is, is low level and when we have a low frequency. If you go higher in frequency, for example, at 10 Hertz, this tapping transforms into vibration, and then finally 100 Hertz, the vibration also transforms into, into, uh, into pressure. And uh, then we also get this uh, electrical sensation of, of uh, tingling and, and, and uh, uh, itching and, and so on and so on. So we have a perceptual space in which we, which we can regulate the parameters and, and shape up the sensation that, that we are eliciting in, in our subjects. Now, another challenge, and this is again something that uh, uh, Matthias has mentioned, it's going to be very difficult for me to, to say anything new, and Matthias has discovered it very well. But uh, uh, this is from the dorsal side, this is actually a, a perception on, uh, on the forearm, right? We didn't stimulate the hand, but the forearm, but it doesn't really, really matter. This is from the dorsal side, this is from the volar, volar side of the, of the forearm. And you see that uh, the sensation quality is similar, but still is different for the, for the same. Uh, stimulation parameters. So this uh, electrical stimulation is uh, somehow specific, it is different across subjects, and it's also different across places where you where you apply it in the in the skin. And uh, so there are positive side, negative sides, right? Uh, and, and obviously we, we, we like electrotactile stimulation, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. And one of the nice advantages is, is that uh, these uh, systems for electrotactile feedback are very compact because you don't have mechanical elements like in vibration, right, the interfaces. And, uh, you know, those electrodes, they can be printed in different sizes and different shapes, and you can stimulate the different parts of the, of the human body. So there is a lot of flexibility in this, both uh, in terms of uh, compactness and uh, then also the electrodes, and finally the perceptual space that you can explore with electrotactile stimulation. And this is one nice application that I just uh, wanted to show you. Uh, because it's also related to the application of uh, electrical feedback uh, in virtual reality. This is a so-called Tesla suit, and it really shows that you can apply electrical stimulation all around the body. So this is a suit that uh, you, you wear, and then uh, it's uh, integrated uh, with electrodes, and those electrodes are on the back, on the belly, on the arms, on the legs. And uh, basically, if you engage uh, in electrical, in, in virtual reality, this uh, suit can provide you electrical feedback. And one of the demos that they show is that, uh, for example, someone is shooting at you, and then uh, first uh, they activate uh, the electrode here, and you feel a touch here, and then they activate the electrode here, and it's like a bullet coming out of you, right? So it's a kind of a very uh, dramatic example, but, but actually it works. Now, coming back uh, to tactility, uh, our specific challenge in tactility is actually uh, a substantially different scale. So here we have stimulation of the body, we have large electrodes, while here, actually, we have small electrodes, electrodes that are placed on the hand. And uh, this is uh, really a, a, a different, uh, different uh, dimension for, for us. Uh, and when we think about uh, using electrotactile feedback in virtual reality, then uh, obviously we have some basic sensations that we would like to create in order for this to be functional interface. And this table uh, is, is uh, listing those sensations. Those are the basic building blocks for more complex haptic effects. First of all, uh, we would like to, to be able to uh, elicit uh, uh, a single isolated contact, right? If you touch something with your fingertip in a single point, you should be able to uh, provide sensation, to elicit sensation of, of touch, right? Single isolated contact. But then also, if you have a, a complex object, we would like to be able to pro produce uh, multiple simultaneous contacts all around the hand. Then uh, these are the static contacts when you're touching something. But what if something is moving across your hand? Then uh, you would like to produce a sensation of moving contact across the hand. You would like to regulate, we would like to regulate the contact size. If, if you press stronger into something, then uh, more of your finger will be, will be activated. And finally, uh, it would be nice to provide texture. If you touch something, uh, uh, you know, which is smooth 
or something which is rough, it would be nicer to be able to provide the different sensations in this case with, with the electrotactile interface. And if you have these basic building blocks, then uh, you can also uh, uh, produce uh, much, much uh, 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 these higher level passives, right? If I, if I can produce a multi contact uh, sensation, then if I grasp uh, an object, maybe I can recognize the shape, even without looking into, into that object, right? And so on and so on. But the basic building blocks are the core of the, of the, of the feedback that, that we would like to, to, to produce. And this is how we started working in the project. Uh, we started from these basic elements and uh, from the simplest of those basic elements, which is uh, providing uh, a single point of contact or activating, uh, uh, you know, the single point of the, of the fingertip. And uh, uh, we produced uh, an electrode. Vitalia uh, 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 Serbia actually produced uh, the electrode here. Uh, this is the electrode, which is kind of uh, small, and then it's placed on the fingertip. It has eight stimulation points here. And the first thing that we asked is, uh, well, well, let's apply this electrode on the fingertip. And then uh, we are going to ask our subjects, if we activate uh, some of these pads, what do they feel? And this is how we did it. Uh, there was uh, an app uh, also made by Vitalia uh, Serbia. And in this uh, app, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a touch screen here. Uh, we activate uh, one of these pads randomly. <coughs> and then uh, the subjects, uh, they indicate in this grid by uh, touching the cells where they feel the sensation. So we just wanted to see if uh, we really can selectively activate the parts of the finger because we are working on this tiny scale. Right? If we can selectively activate parts of the finger then there is a lot of potential for a very nice feedback for, for virtual reality. And uh, those are the results that we obtained in a uh, number of subjects. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the electrode, and uh, then uh, 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 those are the, the heat maps. And in the heat maps uh, with this, uh, you know, black and red color, uh, this is the grid that uh, subjects have uh, most often selected when uh, when the pads have been activated. So this is the activation of different pads, and you can see that our results are quite nice. Most of the subjects they selected the the cell which is directly beneath the activated pad. But then also we have some distribution of sensations around. So this uh, activation is not like a mechanical activation. We still have some spreading of, of sensation around. So that, that was, a, that was a, a nice result uh, for, for us, uh, uh, kind of an encouraging result because we didn't train the subject to recognize anything. It's a natural stimulation and natural response of the, of the subjects. Uh, and then whenever you uh, apply this electrotactile stimulation, you need uh, to activate uh, a pad where you would like to elicit sensation. And then uh, you also need a reference pads to close the electrical circuit. Those are the pads that you don't want actually to, to feel, right? You want to feel sensation here, but not here. So I tell you this because uh, we have also investigated in this study what happens when we play with these uh, reference pads. So this is uh, the, uh, the, the, the answers of the subjects about uh, where they feel sensation when we activated uh, the pad number two here. And uh, then uh, we have selected different uh, pads for the, for the reference. This is only two pads for the reference. This is more pads, like five pads, uh, uh, seven pads for the, for the reference, right? And uh, according to what we know uh, about electrotactile stimulation, the larger the reference is, uh, the, the, the more focused uh, should, should be this, uh, this uh, sensation that, that, we, that we obtain. So our idea was by increasing the reference to actually have more focused stimulation of the, of the point. And this is okay. The, this is what we got uh, for the pad number two, right? Uh, you see that uh, when we increase the reference, well, this sensation at least doesn't become larger, right? But when we activate uh, the pad number six, which is uh, this pad here, we actually get a, a very interesting response, right? When we increase the reference, you see from one to two to three to four, then uh, we get a more selective sensation. But then when we continue increasing, the sensation spreads again. And that was for us a, 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 an interesting result. And I, I don't uh, share this with you just, just because, you know, this playing with the reference is, is, is interesting or it is going to be critical for, for the application of electroductile simulation. But just actually to show you that uh, although the fingertip is a nice place to provide feedback, it has its own secrets and it has its own challenges. And with electrical stimulation, you are actually activating the nerves. And then those uh, interesting effects that we are getting that are counterintuitive for us, they are actually because you are activating different neural structures in the, in the finger. And you are not activating the localized receptors here. So that's why we can have this 
spreading of sensation. And this is something to keep in mind when you work with electrotactile feedback. Now, despite uh, these uh, you know, unusual results that we got here, uh, if we have the reference of three pads, that was quite nice for us. And we said, okay, this is uh, very promising and you can get uh, some nicely focused uh, sensation. And then uh, we wanted actually to explore uh, the flexibility of electrotactile stimulation and then to print different electrodes and to play with these sensations that we can elicit when we change the size and the arrangement of the pads on the, on the fingertip. And uh, again, in uh, collaboration with, uh, with uh, Technalia Serbia, uh, we produced uh, different electrodes. And uh, now, actually, from the fingertip, we went uh, to the whole finger. The first uh, type uh, that we produced uh, was uh, uh, just a simple matrix electrode. Uh, it's a regular uh, uh, arrangement of the pads across uh, the phalanges. And that was our benchmark. But then we also changed uh, a little bit this design and uh, we shifted one of the pads upwards. And we were thinking that this design where not all pads are in a regular structure, will actually facilitate the recognition of the pads because you have a little bit different arrangement of, of those pads on the fingertip. And then we also produced the two circular designs because uh, they can be used to produce different tactile effects. For example, a rotating bar around the finger. So that's something that you cannot get uh, with the matrix. We produced the two versions, one with a reference electrode inside and the other circular design with the uh, distributed reference. The reference was inside and also outside. We expected that this uh, distributed reference will actually be uh, uh, with better performance because uh, then the reference is again larger and uh, we expected to have more localized uh, sensations and better recognition from the, from the side of the, of the subject. So then we said, okay, now we have a set of electrodes uh, for the whole finger. Uh, we would like to actually compare those electrodes and uh, we took first uh, the parts that go to the fingertip and then we compared those uh, designs. In this case, uh, we trained the subject. So that was not natural stimulation anymore, but we trained the subject. We activate the pad and we show them the pad. And then we do a training of uh, you know, five minutes. And after that, we test them. We activate the pad randomly and then we ask them which pad is active. Can you actually localize the, the sensation that, that we that we uh, elicited. And again, uh, we got uh, some, some nice results, uh, but uh, also results that are uh, counterintuitive for us a bit. When comparing these two matrix designs, we expected that the matrix design, uh, second one, performs a little bit better, but actually they performed uh, the same. So we didn't get uh, any advantage by changing the configuration of the pads. And uh, when we compared the two circular designs, the design with distributed reference actually performed worse and we expected the other way the other way around so again the fingertip is is there to surprise us uh, a little bit but what is good is that uh, we got high success rate in recognizing individual parts across the fingertip with all the designs 80 percent success rate in recognizing the exactly activated pad so again quite an encouraging result for for the application of electrical stimulation and now if we take all the matrices and we put them across the full finger and then uh, 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 test the, the recognition rate, we actually get 60% uh, of success. And one could say, okay, 60%, uh, well, that's uh, maybe not that much, but you have to think that uh, there are 16 to 19 different pads on the whole finger. So this is actually very good recognition of the pads, taking into account the number of pads that you need to differentiate across, across the full finger. So again, very encouraging, encouraging results uh, for us. Then we have compared the uh, different uh, phalanges and uh, as uh, you could expect, you know, the fingertip uh, had uh, the highest success rate and then the middle phalange and the proximal phalange, they had uh, lower success rates. So that's uh, something that we could expect from physiology. Fingertip is the most sensitive and with the highest resolution of, of tactile sensations. And then again, uh, an interesting result uh, in, in uh, this is uh, actually uh, 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 when we uh, activate the pads, and then uh, uh, if the subject makes a mistake, but still points uh, to the right phalange, that's a success. And uh, this is the uh, activated phalange, distal, middle and proximal, and this is the predicted phalange. And I show you this uh, because again, it's a surprise from the side of the electrotactile stimulation. Sometimes the subjects would actually make mistakes across phalanges. We activate the pad on the fingertip, and they say it's a middle phalange or a proximal phalange. 
So again, a word of caution. Although we can get a high success rate for individual pets, because of this innervation of the finger, we can have some strange results that we apply the electrotactile stimulation on the fingertip while actually you perceive the sensation on the, on the middle phalange. Those are these referred sensations with electrotactile stimulation that we also know from, from, other, from other applications as, as well. How am I with time? Five minutes. Five minutes, yes, very good. Uh, and then coming back or connecting also to, to something that Matia has said, uh, the calibration of electrotactile sensation is uh, actually quite, uh, quite a challenging uh, aspect for us. So since uh, we have tested the, the full finger, then uh, we could uh, develop those maps. These are the stimulation intensities that are calibrated for the pads across the full finger in different subjects. Those are four different subjects. And you can see that uh, these two subjects, they have similar patterns. The highest intensity was in the middle of the fingertip here, while actually the, the, then the, the, the other pads were, were lower. While in these two subjects, actually, they have similar patterns again, but they are completely different from these first two. In these cases, we have the highest intensity in the upper left corner on the fingertip, and then it goes down. So how to capture this with the, with the calibration algorithm is, is, a, is a challenge. But, but as Matthias has said, we think that we, have a, a, we can reach, a, we can achieve a good compromise. Very good. So now we know that we can actually activate uh, selectively parts of the finger, and we can activate uh, specific parts, and uh, the subjects can actually perceive those activation. But uh, how about uh, detecting the contact size? So what does it mean, contact size? Well, if we have a pattern like this, and we activate uh, one pad, two pads, three pads, four pads, can actually the subject perceive that uh, the activation area is increasing in, in size? This is uh, for the static contacts, and this is for the dynamic contacts. In this dynamic case, uh, we actually activate the pad, and then we move it. And then we, here we activate the two pads, and then we move them across, across the finger. And we did uh, something similar, a similar experiment as uh, with, uh, with the fingertip electrode. We asked the subject to draw sensations here, elicited in the static situation and in dynamic situation. This is one example subject. And again, we see that uh, you know, we are getting something which is kind of intuitive. Uh, if you have a single pad and if you have six pads, you actually have different area of the skin activated. The subjects feel that different area of the skin is activated. But actually, this increase is not very linear. As you can see, one, two, and three, they are increasing. And then from three to four, there is a big jam. And then four, five, and six, they are completely the same. So we have some leverage to regulate the size of the contact. But uh, this is not a completely straightforward. In the dynamic case, we have something very similar. This is for one pad, this is for two pads, very similar. But then for three pads, it's a clear difference of contact size. So we have no linear increase in size when we are actually increasing uh, the activation of the, of the, of the pads. And uh, this is uh, something that also points out uh, in, in, in some other tests that we have done, but I will actually skip this test because uh, the basic conclusion is that we can regulate the size, but it's a little bit uh, challenging. And I'd like to show you one of the last uh, experiments that we have done, and it's uh, uh, now moving uh, forward in this table of tactile effects. Uh, we have been asking ourselves, okay, now we can you know, detect contacts and we can also regulate the size of the contact, but how about uh, the texture? Feeling texture could be very important in, in virtual reality, right? Uh, because it could increase the feeling of immersiveness when you interact uh, with, with objects. And uh, uh, an obvious uh, choice to encode the, the texture in virtual reality uh, or with a little tactile feedback would be the frequency. And uh, we have done an experiment uh, where we uh, have a collection of uh, sandpapers. These sandpapers, they have different roughness. And then uh, we have asked uh, the subject uh, to actually touch the sandpaper and slide along this paper while we provide a stimulation on the, on the index finger. So the middle finger was used for touching while the stimulation was provided on the index finger. And then we have uh, provided the subject with the opportunity to change the frequency of stimulation. There was a bar here, and they could change the frequency. And the task for them was actually to adjust the frequency of stimulation so that they have similar sensation to the texture that they feel. And we just uh, let them play. And then we didn't know what we are going to get at the end. But actually what we get is quite nice. This is the texture from most rough to actually most uh, smooth, that was just a uh, paper. And we see that uh, as, the roughness, as, the, as the roughness decreases, so the, 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 the surface becomes smoother and smoother, 
we actually increase the frequency of stimulation. So the subjects are increasing the frequency of stimulation because that corresponds to less or more, more smooth sensation on the, of texture on the, on, the, on the fingertip. And then if you look into the individual profiles for individual subjects, again, we have this uh, variety, right? These are three subjects. And this is the mapping between the texture and the frequency that they selected. For example, in this case, you see that uh, you have a saturation also on this side and this side of the curve. But in this subject, it seems that uh, he could go even, even higher with the, with the frequency, right? So there is, there is, there is more potential in, in this subject to actually modulate the roughness over, over, over a wider, wider range. And you can see that uh, if you take a particular value of the roughness, three different subjects, they associate three completely different frequencies from 20 to 140 hertz. So roughness is intuitively associated to frequency, but these associations are different for, for, different, for different subjects. And finally, very briefly, uh, since uh, out, uh, out of this research, we have realized that uh, actually these dynamic patterns, uh, you know, the patterns uh, where the paths are changing spatially are very nice uh, to, to understand, right? Uh, then we also uh, tried uh, to apply the technology with interactivity for general human computer interaction, right? So far, I've been uh, telling you about natural interaction. You touch something, you feel feedback. But let's say that you're working in this uh, VR world and it's very engaging, visually and auditory, and you would like to send a message to the, to the user, right? So this message, this icon, for example, the success or error or warning, or there is a call coming to you, this message could also be sent through the tactile interface, right? By producing specific patterns of activation in these electrodes. And we have used uh, the tactility glove, one of the versions, and then we have developed some patterns, for example, the loading pattern, we activate those electrodes in circles, like a loading bar, several times until the user reacts. Then, uh, for example, notification, we activate all the paths flash a couple of times to draw your attention to it. And finally, we have tested a number of these patterns in several subjects. And these dynamic patterns are actually very easy to differentiate. You see that the recognition rate in, in 10 of these patterns, in, in many cases, is close to 100%, right? So it's a very nice uh, outcome that you can also use this uh, tactile interface for general human computer interaction, not only for natural feedback. Since I think I'm over time, I'm gonna stop here. These are the conclusions. Maybe you can read them. If not, uh, then yeah, we can discuss them afterwards. So again. No problem, no problem. I mean, we have enough time also to take questions. So thanks first <laughs> for the presentation. So, is there a question from the audience? Yes, there is one. Okay. There are several. Okay. I am Alvaro Bertelsen from Technical Tech. I just wanted to know um, I was uh, interested when in this experiment in which you have to pass your finger uh, different sound papers and try to adjust the tree of the frequency values from the other arms. That kind of feedback is similar to the next to the touch. I just want to wonder if there is, if there is any way to um, to use the electrical uh, gas uh, sensors to actually get the uh, some characteristics of the electrical sensation. So we don't need to adjust this. Uh, is there any way to go beyond that? Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a that's a nice that's a nice uh, 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 that's a nice uh, question. And uh, well, uh, with the electrodes that we have, uh, they are made for uh, electrical stimulation, right? But uh, for instance, in the, in the later talk, uh, when we speak about the uh, uh, application of uh, electrotactile feedback in tele manipulation, you will see that uh, uh, our partner from Genoa has developed an electronic skin. Electronic skin actually is a flexible sheet that you can uh, put around the finger. And uh, typically you do this uh, around the finger of the robotic hand and uh, you detect mechanical interaction. So you don't provide feedback, but you are actually recording mechanical interaction between the end effector and the surface. If you have this skin, and if I have, for example, a robotic hand or a prosthesis, if I pull it across the surface, I will get electrical signals that are actually quite close, that reflect this texture. These electrical signals could then be translated into electrical pulses sent to the subject controlling the hand. So in that sense, this would be automatic. For example, if I put, a, let's say, a threshold, and then uh, the sensors of the electronic skin are firing. 
whenever they pass the threshold, I can send a pulse to the human subject, to this tactile glove. And then uh, if you have uh, something which is more rough, the pattern of pulses will change. And the pattern of simulation will change. So that will be completely automatic, as you, as you said. So it's, it's, uh, it's possible. And then again, I think it's an important point uh, to just be fair about electrotactile simulation. And it just, uh, you just uh, reminded me, in all these experiments we have done, we have done it uh, without visual reality. So there was no visual feedback. It was purely tactile feedback. Once you have visual feedback, you will have fusion of information. So I have shown you that uh, different subjects have selected different values for frequency for the same roughness. And then you could say, okay, if you selected 100 hertz and I selected 20 hertz, if I touch something in virtual reality and you send me a wrong value, then it's not going to be it's not going to feel right. But it's not like that because you will see the texture as well. And this visual feedback will, I think, uh, uh, n n normalize or equalize this electrical feedback across subjects. And that's that's an important factor to consider with with these tests. We have one question here. Yes, yes. So, one question. I feel from the experiments you have conducted, have you have you done them with elderly people, or and if so, how would it affect? I mean, would there be big differences between younger individuals and older individuals? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very good question, and unfortunately, we have, haven't done it. Right. It would be a very nice uh, thing to do also with elderly, right? Uh, for different applications, but also if you consider that the virtual reality will. Uh, permeate uh, different uh, age uh, categories. Uh, I would expect uh, that, uh, but but something that we have done, for example, we have tested amputees. Okay. And sometimes we had amputees that are older. And we could see that the cognitive aspect here comes into play. So typically the results that we get in young, healthy people, students, and, and uh, you know, general public are higher than what you get in, 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 in elderly or, or in, in disabled people. Right? So that's one factor to take into account. Now. Arsen Hunnigan from Manus. Um, it, it, in the, the slide that you had uh, comparing different users, uh, um, uh, when, when touching a texture, they uh, needed a different frequency to match the same perception. Um, how did that differ from person to person? Was there a baseline of frequency raised? Was there some correlation? Um, uh, we, we, so so that, that was an experiment that, that was not finished. So we have to still look into it and we have to collect more subjects to be able to draw any conclusions. Right. So right now I cannot, I cannot tell you anything more than uh, what I've shown that we have seen variability. But then uh, if, uh, if there are maybe groups of subjects, someone in the low end of the frequencies and, and, and a group in, in the high end of frequencies, this I, I still cannot tell you. We, we actually intended to continue with these experiments. One of the issues that we have here was the, 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 the speed. Right, because uh, how fast you go across the texture, this will also regulate the feeling, the sensation that you have. And the next step for us uh, it will be to, to mount uh, the, the sand tape on the, on the electric motor so that you just uh, place your finger and then the electric motor with the same speed is uh, coming uh, across. And we, we, I, I think with, with a better setup, we, we might look into this separation of people in the, in the groups. And uh, of course, pressure becomes that you have to exactly. Yeah. Also pressure. Yes. Yes. So it's not a simple. It's not a simple experiment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Strahinia.